start reason. There we go. All right. Well, welcome everyone. This is our uh, final session of the beginning Cure Farmer series. Uh, see a lot of familiar faces and some new ones here. Uh, it is really great to see all of you, and we really appreciate uh, your interest in care farming and your curiosity and showing up tonight. Uh, my name is Kate Mudge, and I work as a, a contractor with the Care Farming Network. I'll be facilitating today's session, and uh, Woody and Andrea from Care Farming Network are also joining us. Um, there we go. So as we move through today's session on how to fund a care farm, you may have some questions that arise. So um, we're going to work on answering those in a, as best as we can during the session. We're also going to have 15 minutes for Q&A towards the end of our session today. Um, and I just want to point out, we've had three other sessions. All of the recordings are available online. Uh, you can find them uh, under the events on the Beginning Care Farmer Series webpage. And you may also notice that we are focusing these sessions on farms that are located in the Northeast region of the U.S. that specifically serve individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, this is because the Care Farming Network received support from the National Institute of Food and Agriculture through the Northeast SARE program. Uh, so even with that uh, kind of focus area and some of these slides, we really hope that what we share tonight is helpful to anyone in any region uh, for serving any diverse population for care farms. And so tonight we're just going to be kind of giving a broad overview, um, talking a bit about the importance of telling your story, business planning, sharing a lot of resources, both for nonprofit and for-profit care farms, and then including some um, advice and tips from care farmers, which is, to me, the most fun in these series is to be hearing from others. And as I said, we're going to follow up with about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. So jumping into things, where to start? So care farmers are social entrepreneurs. And we're motivated by a desire to improve the lives of others and develop really innovative ways to do so. So funding considerations are compounded by the fact that care farms can form under different legal structures. Uh, financing options vary depending on what structure you are. And funders can also have their own preferences for what they uh, give dollars to. And so the question again, where do you start? There isn't one specific type of care farm or a how-to manual that outlines each step. So tonight we're going to actually start uh, with talking about telling your story. Because in order to fundraise, you essentially need to influence behavior change from your various stakeholders. And to develop a compelling story, you need a really clear vision statement that answers these four questions. So who will I serve? And what is my farm's purpose? What am I gonna be offering? And what are my values? And we talk about this kind of as a vision statement. It lays the foundation um, for really any social enterprise upon which um, those are built. And your vision should really be compelling and it should be achievable, distinctive and clear and inclusive. And the importance of telling your own story cannot be overstated because the work and the path that you create towards creating your vision, ultimately your care farm, serves to inspire those that are gonna support you. So many of the care farms in our network highlight the history um, on their websites. And it's worth checking out um, how they do so because a lot of their histories, um, their origin stories are really inspiring. I have here on this slide, just one example of how Bittersweet Farms shares their story. Uh, it kind of begins with their history and their vision. And so the power of a great story can be used as your core fundraising technique. Your story's objective is first to educate 
and to evoke really powerful feelings of empathy. So getting someone to feel through what you're telling them is an important part of your story. And it may make the difference between them waving you away or being willing to help. And when someone is emotionally invested, obviously they're far more likely to feel attached to that thing and to donate. And of course, it goes without saying, attachment can breed loyalty. And donors wanna keep connected over a longer period of time so they really feel that they can make an impact. They may become so passionate that they continue your legacy by sharing your story onwards with their own social circles and friends and family. And here's the thing, you don't have to be a professional writer to develop your story. There are so many free resources available on the internet that can help guide you through the process. And we are gonna be sharing a list of resources with you after this presentation that will be emailed out. They're also gonna be available on our website because particularly when it comes to telling your origin story, whether you're trying to do it for the first time or you want to refresh your approach, a powerful narrative is the foundation of successful fundraising. The slide that I have up right now will be in the resources. Um, I love it. It's a video that really talks you through developing your story. Um, it's, a, it's a neat approach. It's short and uh, really helpful. So why do donors give? Donors give because oftentimes they wanna feel like heroes. They wanna be part of something bigger than themselves. And your goal in any fundraising plan is to provide a really clear and concise and impactful map that will show people how you plan on making change. So these questions here may be good prompts for you to help you answer why people should give to your organization. By no means is this an exhaustive list, but just to point out a few, um, getting youth to think about the future. What would an ideal news headline look like 20 years from now about your, your farm? And what is your dream? And if you're successful, what would it look like for donors, for the clients? Um, what do you want to change and what kind of community do you want to form? So regardless of your care farm size or your financial status, whether you're just starting out um, or whether you've been at it for a while, uh, there's a business plan with this. And when you create a business plan, you're effectively creating a blueprint for how your farm is going to be run, who's going to be responsible for what, and how you want to achieve your goals. So a business plan also helps you secure support, be it monetary, or in-kind donations, or sometimes even just support from volunteers. And you do need a business plan to convey your purpose and goals. We're gonna see now how your business plan can also serve as your foundation for grant writing and marketing. And I wanna note that Woody's gonna really talk about this um, when he is presenting towards the end of this session. So you're seeking to create social change and a social return on investment, not just a financial return on investment. So your plan should be really precise about how you will achieve your goal. It should include details on what change you're seeking to make, how you're going to make it, and how you're going to measure it. It's also important, I can't stress this enough, to not undersell yourself by being too humble. Um, I live in rural Minnesota. Minnesotans are famous for being, having what we call Minnesota nice. Um, and we never take credit for what we do. So uh, I'm learning that if you have a vision and you want to share it, you also want to compel people to believe that you are capable of creating that vision. And so here's just some do's and don'ts when you're creating either a marketing plan or your business plan, but writing clearly and succinctly and showing enthusiasm, but staying away from using too much jargon um, or too much text or gushing too much about uh, what it is you're planning on doing. So now that we've talked a little bit about how to tell your story, um, and a bit about the importance of business planning. We're gonna explore specific funding opportunities for beginning care farmers.
So this piece uh, really focuses on the USDA um, because the USDA offers a wealth of opportunities for beginning farmers and established farmers. Um, the beginning farmer and rancher coordinators are USDA team members. They're specific to each state. You can actually lean on them to help you understand what the USDA process is and finding the right assistance as you're starting out. So reaching out to your state's coordinator for one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and guidance can be helpful. Uh, they can also connect you with organizations specifically serving beginning farmers. The Farm Service Agency offers loans to help support uh, farmers to get the financing they need. This can be to start a farm, to expand or maintain a farm. You can always contact your local FSA office. They are based in every county, so they're gonna be specific to your region, the folks that are helping you. And they have a bunch of different programs, way too many to mention here. But one thing to note is that you really do need to have a clear understanding of your needs prior to working with your local FSA representative. <clears throat> there are also uh, more traditional lending options specifically to help purchase property. Uh, you may find that community financial development institutions are a good option. They're uh, similar to banks, but they're more mission driven and they're certified by the US Department of Treasury. So they can include credit unions and traditional banks and loan funds, but also venture capital funds, but they operate with a primary mission um, to help uh, social service-based organizations. And don't forget to also check out options from your state's Department of Agriculture. Uh, here in Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture offers down payment assistance grants and other programs uh, for beginning farmers. I seem to have forgotten to uh, advance the slides, so I'm just going to kind of step ahead here. There we go. <laughs> um, there's also uh, crowdfunding platforms, Kickstarter, GoFundMe, and others. Crowdfunding is the use of small amounts of capital from a large number of individuals to finance a new venture. And it uses easy accessibility of vast networks of people through social media, usually, and crowdfunding websites to bring investors and entrepreneurs together. So it increases entrepreneurship by essentially expanding the pool of investors beyond your traditional circle of uh, relatives, friends, and venture capitalists. Uh, I know that there's a few care farms that have used something like GoFundMe or Kickstarter to help them when they were first starting out. And then here are just some other examples of funding options. Kiva microloans are available to farmers all over the world to expand enterprises. They fund specific projects. Uh, these interest-free loans are available as direct loans through PayPal for you as farmers. And the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition highlights also regional grant opportunities. I would suggest that you sign up for their newsletter alerts. Uh, beginningfarmer.org, they also list local and regional food project grants that, and they're constantly updating their list. So check out their websites, sign up for an email list. You never know what might be coming your way uh, that wasn't on your radar before. And then through the USDA's uh, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, uh, farmers can apply for grants that typically run between $500 and $15,000 for various projects. Again, SARE is a regional organization, so you would want to check with your uh, specific region for their funding opportunities. We also have the Center for Rural Affairs. It's a great resource that offers links and advice for applying to beginning farmer funding programs. And also check out their farm finances page for a lot of useful tips on planning your financing strategy. They have a wonderful outline that kind of walks you through step by step. Um, we have the Carrot Project here. They have loan programs that are available to businesses uh, primarily on the East Coast. They serve Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Maine. They also offer uh, capital or operating loans to farms anywhere in the 5000 to a couple hundred thousand dollar range. So that was a lot about what farm loans are. 
But, you know, we all want to know where, where's the grant money, right? What don't we have to repay? And often if you're, you know, a nonprofit organization, there's a lot of opportunities for you out there too, um, to receive grant funding and to receive tax deductible donations. You can find a list of resources actually on our website uh, under the grant funding tab that provide opportunities. Uh, I should also note that we've covered fundraising and social media tips and tricks in our past monthly member gatherings. All of those are recorded and you can view them on our website under videos. So you might wanna check those out too. So there are also a lot of local options available. They're not always on our radar as a national network. Um, here's an example. There were two care farms that were recipients of Kubota's Hometown Proud Challenge. Again, here in Minnesota, we have a Lakewinds Organic Field Fund. They provide annual grants of $8,000 uh, specifically to organic farmers. But if you have a list serve available to you, um, oftentimes these can be found through farming organizations or an extension service. It's a great idea to add your name to it so that you can be notified of funding opportunities that are in your neck of the woods. I know I do that here in Minnesota and I'm just weekly finding out about um, <clears throat> possibilities. As a network, we do try to highlight opportunities for care farms when we learn about them. Uh, we send a monthly newsletter, so we'll have opportunities available in there. Um, we post on our social media pages, so you'll want to make sure that you check those out. Um, just a brief nod to our Facebook discussion group, Care for Maine Facebook discussion group. That um, is a place for you to post your own uh, funding opportunities or ask questions, see if anyone else has worked with a donor that you might be interested in. So um, it is a closed group. You might have to answer a couple questions before joining, but again, it's care farming discussion group. So sometimes a little detective work can go a long way towards finding donors. Researching who supports other similar organizations in your area is a great way to find supporters who are already on board with your mission. Uh, you can Google your zip code look for foundations. You can go and look at foundations 990 forms, that's their tax return essentially, to understand maybe what type of uh, organizations they support um, or who funders are working with. Uh, consider attending other organizations events too. Maybe they don't care farms, but uh, you can get connected in uh, just simply by networking that way visiting, connecting with other organization staff and board members, obviously your own colleagues. And don't forget about in-kind donations. We uh, hear about this all the time from care farms. So in-kind support, you know, once you have a budget of items that you need to purchase, for example, or supplies that you'll need, keep it handy and approach businesses in your region for support. They might not give you dollars, but if you can um, get other supplies without purchasing them, obviously that's a boom. We have Jen here from Little Otter saying um, that they get so much from their community, cardboard and wood chips, glassware, rubber bands, um, builds the connections, saves you money. So there's also just a ton of helpful tools that can aid in either fundraising or marketing efforts. Um, a CRM database that tracks your donations. Maybe you're not at the point right now where you need to think about them <clears throat> or having something like that, but at some point Excel spreadsheets will become a bit burdensome. Um, so Network for Good is just one example of a CRM. Uh, Squarespace. Great, inexpensive uh, website builder there. Uh, Instrumental uh, is a grant database. I believe there is a cost to join that, but you can search for grants if you're a member there. And Canva for nonprofits. For those who are not familiar with Canva, check them out. They are free for nonprofits to use. And anytime you want to make something glitzy and you don't know how to use Photoshop or Adobe, Canva does it for you. I cannot 
um, say how helpful they've been in my own work. Uh, it's graphic design for dummies. Uh, so don't forget about that kind of stuff too. So I'm going to call your attention again uh, to the resource page that we're going to be sharing because within that page, we're going to provide, be providing you also examples of how to present your budget. There's also going to be a link to a grant example and a logic model uh, that you could use or replicate that might help you make sense of the processes that you could find helpful in crafting either your own business plan or grant submission. Mm -hmm. There's no need to recreate the wheel. So reach out if you need support in developing your own narratives and compelling stories and corresponding documentation too. So each session for those that have joined us has had um, somebody speaking specifically to kind of some of the topics that we've covered. And tonight we're welcoming Woody back. Uh, he is the founder and executive director of Red Wiggler Community Farm. He's going to share some of his thoughts on fundraising and what his journey looked like uh, many moons ago when he began Red Wiggler and also how it evolved over time. So I will pass it off to you, Woody. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to jump to the elevator speech, slide 30. Curveball. Oh, no pig. Uh, there we go. The Blues Brothers. <laughs> uh, so I, I thought I'd start with the elevator speech. Like if I've got you for just 30 seconds or two minutes, this is what I say about Red Wiggler Community Farm. Um, and I say I founded Red Wiggler back in 1996. Uh, today, what we do is we grow and sell vegetables as a framework for training adults with developmental disabilities. And we do that in the most inclusive way uh, that we can. And if you'd like to learn more, check it, you know, contact me. Here's my card. So an elevator speech can be that fast. Um, and that is an introduction to myself. Now back up to where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, now the longer version of our origin story, which I'll weave through this portion. I think I have, a um, gosh, I've got like almost 20 minutes to talk, which is wonderful for me because I'm often um, elliptical in my the way that I communicate. Uh, back in the early 90s, I was a starving artist with an art degree and no job. And I was working restaurants. I took a job working in a group home because I felt like if I'm going to get paid nothing, I might as well be helping people while get paid not much. Uh, and I really uh, just day one or day the first week, I just love the work. And so I came up with this concept of, um, gosh, the people I'm working with in these group homes, they need something meaningful to, to do during the day. And ideally, they need a job. But I also noticed that the food that was uh, we were providing for people um, in the group homes uh, was a lot of sugary and salty and canned and boxed foods. And so I, I thought, well, I think we need to make it a priority to have access to healthy food. Uh, for everyone involved in these, you know, when we sit down to dinner, it's not just the, the, the people with, you know, that are residents there, but it's also the caregivers sitting down and everybody needs to eat well. So it, it just became like very clear that there was an opportunity here. And I just started from there to tell a story that, that was like, I see a problem. And here's a way to like address it concretely. Um, so I started just chatting up anybody who listened to me about what I wanted to do. And I have to say, I really like within the first couple of weeks, I feel like I had, I felt like I had found my groove. I was, there was a lot of enthusiasm. I was just, well, it's interesting to see this picture of the old me back when I was younger. Um, 
you know, that that enthusiasm is contagious. And so I just started telling people what the problem was and what I thought a, a solution was and and how perhaps, um, you know, I could uh, do this within the organization I started in. Um, I'm going to say, let's go to the next slide. Uh, hey, thanks. Um, and so talking with my colleagues, friends, family members, of all that group, they start saying, well, you need to talk to this person. And so I did. And I just kept following uh, the path. Um, and I would essentially uh, talk to anybody who would listen about what I wanted to do. And when you are talking with them, you need to paint a picture of what you're, what you're envisioning. So today, what I talk about is, uh, you know, our growers with intellectual and developmental disabilities, they plant seeds in the, in the, actually in the winter in the greenhouse, uh, and then they cultivate them and care for them, and then they plant them out, uh, uh, weed and, and water and care for those plants and ultimately harvest and distribute to a customer. Because as this picture shows you, this was our first year. We had boxes on the floor. We don't do that anymore. That's <laughs> we put them on tables. Um, but uh, here we're creating our, our first uh, year of CSA boxes, uh, community supported agriculture um, shares of of the produce. Um, and there's a job coach working with one of our growers, Joni. Um, so the, the pitch developed as things uh, moved along. Next slide. Uh, and next slide. Uh, and I will say that I will touch this in a second. Uh, actually, what I want to say is that it takes time to develop your, your story. And in the beginning, you've got to test it out. You've got to listen to the response. In my case, the response was overwhelming. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I think that I'd love to see that happen. Well, those are like the, you know, uh, bing, bing, bing in the back of your head, like, oh, here's a funder. So now I've got my first perhaps funder. And in my case, one of those people who was like energetic as I was, I said, well, well, do you think you could help out? And he said to me, what, what do you think you need to get started? And I said, $10,000, <laughs> which he said, well, okay, let's do that. Moral of that story is always have in your back pocket the answer to a question like, what do you need? And the other aspect of that story is that I probably undershot with $10,000. I just didn't know it. So uh, we'll jump ahead and I only have so much time. I mean, it's it's hard to speak to all of you all because I know you're in different um, sort of cycles of, of where you are, but everybody always talks about a business plan. And I asked to title this demystifying the business plan because really, um, the, here's how I did it. I knew from day one I needed to run a non a, a a charitable nonprofit, and that I would be raising money, and that that would be the bulk of how we funded our program. So what you need first off is you need to have the IRS sign off on your organization and that you are tax exempt. That means that you file a form nine, no, not 990, a form 1023, which is your application for tax exemption. In that application, you have to write, there's a lot of like check boxes that your attorney or some somebody else is gonna help you through. But the thing that you have to do if you're starting a nonprofit is you need to write the narrative of what you're gonna do how it's going to benefit the community, 
and uh, what the outcomes might be. And then the next cool thing is you get to write your first bud three year budget, <laughs> which in the beginning is very daunting. However, it forces you to start writing your ideas, both in narrative and in financials, because the financials drive your, your narrative. You can't have a, a narrative without the money to pay for it. Uh, so my first business plan was my application to the IRS. The next business plan that we wrote didn't come for another three years. And I think I'm gonna say next slide. Uh, and the, within the next three years, um, well, for the first three years, and I'll get into this in a minute, as we were funded on private donations that original, what I call angel donor, um, who funded us with $10,000 and then sales. And then what I would call sweat equity. And that's how I existed for the first three years at Red Wiggler. Then we were like, okay, uh, a friend of mine said, you ought to write a grant to this organization. So I went to there. By that time, we had websites. When I started Red Wiggler, we didn't have websites to go to. <laughs> uh, but by then, I could go and I could look at the guidelines of the ABLE Foundation out of Washington, D.C. And that those guidelines became the first structure or outline for my business plan. And my that that second business plan, the first being the IRS application, the second being this this grant that I wrote. That's my business plan. And I, you just keep going back to uh, to to these documents that you're writing that theoretically have money at the end of the rainbow. And so I very organically developed the business plan. So this slide talks about the, the, the sort of nuts and bolts of these, um, what I call the base grant. So after the first probably 10 years, what we started to do was start the fiscal year with a new grant that was a base grant. And that grant is basically a work product of ours that just stays internal. And we cut and paste, uh, from that document to uh, fulfill grant um, applications. And this slide just kind of outlines a, a lot of all of that. Um, next slide. So support, a lot of times people say, well, um, you know, after a while, don't you need to hire a, a, a development officer or you know people talk about when's the right time to hire a development officer or perhaps do you hire a contractor well those options generally when you're starting out are not really available to you because you don't have the money uh that's an investment in your future when you do that you have to float those people until they can pay for themselves so what i did was i was the grant writer I'm the engaged, uh, you know, person who started this organization with a cool mission. Um, and so I'm very happy to talk to people about what I do. But what I did was early on is I looked for staff members who were interested in learning about grant writing and fundraising. And so our farm manager, the first year when, when she got to the end of the season uh, in around Thanksgiving, she started helping me with uh, writing grants during the winter. And it was more of uh, her proofreading my work in the beginning. By the end of our work together, before she left to have a family, uh, she was fielding the, the first draft of grants and I was doing what I call window dressing. Um, but I've always cultivated someone within our staff that can be my, I call them a number two, but I think Star Trek calls them a number one. Um, anyway, uh, you need a you need kind of a sidekick because you always need to be proofread. Uh, you also need to recognize that if you get sick or need to step away, 
deadlines don't move. You need somebody to step in and get it going. So I've always cultivated a, um, what I would call fundraising support. Uh, next slide. Um, this just reiterates what I was saying earlier. In the beginning, uh, the way that we existed as we were um, getting our, our feet wet was really through sweat equity um, and volunteerism and friends and family. And not everybody, I mean, I, I will be the first to admit, I, I went to private schools. I had actually uh, connections to people who had wealth. Now I was, as we'll talk about, and I think the next slide, uh, but don't change the slide, um, is that uh, don't be afraid to ask people for money. You never know where it's gonna come from. In my case, I, I just happened to have grown up in an environment where those wealthy people did not intimidate me. I think it's important to recognize that often for some reason our culture is intimidated by wealth, wealthy people. Uh, it, the sooner you can get over that, the better. Um, years four through seven was inter, in, incremental growth. The first three years was about like, okay, here's what we're doing. Uh, we started having an event once a year. We had two events, actually, a farm tour, and we had a, a what you would call today a farm to fork event. Um, and getting people out to the farm that were friends and supporters, that was a good way to thank them and show them what we were doing. But essentially incremental growth in the middle years for us. Um, however, we knew we, we had a story going forward. We needed to move to a new site. And so there was a relocation campaign and we had, a, we had established a new site on a park where we are today. Um, so that became the forward story in the beginning was here's what we want to do and improve lives forward story year four through seven was we need to move and we need to set up that new farm so these are all sorts of things that we can talk about with potential donors or or just again your friends and family um red wiggler has has grown incrementally throughout and i think that we'll continue to be incremental in our growth um, but as you get older, you start to look at like, okay, how do I prove that I'm changing lives? And that gets into outcomes measurement tools. Um, and then ultimately we uh, established a $1.5 million um, capital campaign for facilities, which we accomplished within that time frame. Years 20 to 25 have been about improving um, our processes, and as this says, leaning up the farm. Uh, leaning up the farm is looking at uh, what are we doing that's not paying off or is a drain on staff time or is not working and let's cut it. Um, and uh, I'm looking at the comments. Translate yourself. Yes. Okay. Uh, next slide. So here's the rub, Red Wiggler, uh, you know, as a 501c3, the bulk of our money comes from private foundations. And we started with that one foundation back three years in and wrote that grant and received it uh, for $10,000. I'll never forget the day that showed up in the mail. And I'll never forget that all-nighter, I literally pulled an all-nighter to get it in in the beginning. I mean, it's tough starting out and just to recognize that. Um, today, government grants uh, contribute 15%. Um, Some of that is uh, the grant that's paying for uh, me to be speaking with you and for Kate and Andrea to do the work we do with the Care Farm Network. Um, so nor in the past, before this, uh, the Care Farm Network, that was a smaller number. Um, Individual giving is at 20%. Um, and I think what you're probably interested in is sales, 9%. I've never thought that we would maintain Red Wiggler on sales. That's not what we're in the business of doing. 
we're in the business of bringing people out to the farm to work together to grow and sell healthy vegetables. And that 15 of our employees are people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and they have goals and objectives, life goals, and we want to support them in that. Uh, the running of the sales program is a great way to bring people into the program. It's a loss leader of sorts. It's uh, It generates board members, volunteers, donors. Um, we've not done much with uh, corporate giving. Some civic and religious giving is 5%. Um, events are, again, another loss leader um, for us. Um, you could, some organizations might uh, take that private foundations and call them, uh, um, what do you call it, when it's sponsors. Uh, and then you'd see the events number go up and the private foundations number go down. Um, but in our case, we want to bring people out to the farm. Uh, sage advice, you're moving me along. Oh, relationships, awesome. Um, time check, okay. Uh, I'll stop there and get, get into relationships. So, you know, as that last slide showed, we, we do write about 20 grants a year that generates about 500,000 in, in revenue. Um, how do you keep that going year over year? The first thing I will say about grant writing is that once you score a grant, uh, the the net the next thing you're doing is communicating with them of what you did with their grant the report uh and you're and you should always be writing a second grant on top of that report so don't think of grant so i always we always go and every chance you get go for general operating don't pay for a, a tractor or a truck or a refrigerator if you can if you can if you can get away with it, go for general operating. Uh, and what you do is then the next grant, the best grant that we write after a while is the report. Most important grant you write is the report. So you, that you create um, a, a, re, a repeat customer, uh, someone who continues to give annually, an annual fund, if you will. Um, then there is just con the, the rule of thumb is thank people three times and ask them once. So after you thank them three times, you can ask them again. So there are any number of ways for those touch points, inviting them out for a free farm tour, inviting them out for uh, any sort of uh, activity that's happening. Um, if they don't want, can't get away, uh, get them. Say, hey, let, I'd love to you know, meet with you on the farm. Or if you can't do that, I'll meet you down uh, where you live. Um, but relationships are an ongoing effort. Um, I should also say that uh, I found it very beneficial. And Kate mentioned this earlier: is that uh, attending other people's events, you support your colleagues. When, when they have events, because uh, I don't know how many of you have run events, but don't we always fear that nobody's going to show up, <laughs> you know, or some version of that? Uh, so show up for your, your colleagues. But you know what you get then? You get to look and see who their funders are. You get to understand um, how they do the pitch. Maybe that'll change the way you do your pitch, because no pitch should be stagnant. Um, next slide. Oh, now I need my notes. Where'd my notes go? What was my sage advice? Uh, don't be scared of something. Kate? Um, you had talked about, uh, you mentioned this already, oh. uh, don't fall into the trap of, I don't know how to ask for money and yeah. standing tall yeah that, that's probably the best advice i got early on was like okay everybody's scared to ask people for money uh the sooner you get over that the better off you're gonna be if 
if you believe in what you're doing and the, the mission or purpose, and I should say to answer a question in the chat, mission, purpose, vision, and a number of other words often are very interchangeable. Um, so if you believe in what you're after and, and you embody that, like before going into a meeting, like I can feel it. Like I spent time thinking about this before. The problem is I get nervous sometimes when I do it. Um, but you, you build up your confidence before going in because you believe in the lives you're changing or you believe in the potential for your program to change lives. And you go in, that, that's a wholly different thing. Yes, you have to be tactful. Yes, that's nerve wracking. I don't know how to be tactful. You bring them out, if you can, bring them out to your site. Talk about what you're doing. Talk about where you're heading. And do not let them leave without saying, here are a couple of ways you can be helpful. That can take a variety of, of um, avenues or forks in the road. If you read them and you think that, well, maybe they they would love to introduce you to somebody else that they know, take them up on that. Uh, let them know that in the upcoming year, I've got a $100,000 gap in my projected funding, my budgets, whatever it is, and I've got a gap of whatever it is. Let them know that there's a gap. And would it be okay if I put you on my mailing list? both snail mail and email it each one is different but the bottom line is the faster you or your board if you're a lot that far along can get over this idea of being scared to ask for people with money the better off you're going to be people with a lot of money are used to being asked for money they know how to say no politely they will not hurt your feelings they just won't. They'll say, you've got a great thing, but it's just not something I'm able to fund today. Um, but uh, it's just incredibly important to get over it as soon as you can. And that's the advice I got early on. Gosh, I went way over. Well, you're sticking around for Q&A because we're if it looks like we have some questions in chat that we'll be able to maybe have you tackle. <clears throat> but we are kind of at the end of the time for this session. I have just a few uh, things here to to um, share too, because at the end of uh, each of our sessions, uh, we always do ask for wisdom from other care farms. Um, much of this has already been shared, but Gail from Full Pocket and Jenny from Homesteads for Hope um, are kind of echoing some of the same sentiments that uh, we have uh already shared with you here today. Just a reminder about those previous sessions uh, that are on our website that are recorded. I think by Friday of this week, we'll have this session recorded as well as that resource list back to into your hands. Um, with all of our sessions, uh, we did receive some funding from SARE. Uh, and part of that funding uh, is asking folks to complete an evaluation for their sessions. We promise it's short. I believe Andrea just uh, included it in the chat. It will also be on our follow-up email. Only takes a minute or two to fill out and really helps us fulfill our grant requirements um, and helps us also make for better sessions in the future. So would love to hear your thoughts. So thanks ahead of time for that. And as promised, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we're just going to open up here for some questions. Um, I will help moderate. I'm going to start with a few that were in the chat. Um, but please, you, you do have the ability to unmute yourself if you would like to ask something or if you would like to put it in the chat. That works out well, too. Um, I will, if I'm in the right place here, Ingrid asks, uh, my sense is that there are few grants or loans available to pay yourself. 
for instance, if you're supporting a family, any thoughts on this? And I, I'll state for the record um, on some of the loans I can share because my day job is actually in lending. Loans will allow you to uh, provide for what's kind of called working capital. Uh, and if you need that working capital, sure enough, you can put it into a loan application with the understanding that you have to pay uh, specifically or especially if you're kind of a sole operator, but it's going to ask for other things like outside income too. So it really Matt, uh, depends on kind of if you're needing to do this full-time or part-time. Woody, I know that you had talked about um, uh, the, the grants that will kind of provide general operating. Uh, can you talk a bit if any of those general op grants would allow one to pay themselves? Well, uh, you, if you have a position like uh, farm manager or executive director, um, that's a part of the um, budget that falls in your salary line item. Um, and uh, yes, uh, you should. It is a, a, a common uh, thing that people rely uh, do not value their sweat equity. Um, you need to put in your budgets for grants um, the money that would that you need that it it is you need to in the beginning it's true that you kind of need to weight it down to a reasonable number that's that you can achieve. Um, but don't forget to put yourself in your budgets. Um, yes, uh, general operating grants pay for wages. That's the whole idea. It's, it's people that run programs. And what we need to do is a, um, as a nonprofit like collective uh, is we need to let people know that you, uh, yeah, okay. Giving us money to buy, uh, hand tools is great. Uh, but it's people that teach other people how to use those tools. Um, and those people need to live. Um, and so like in our case, 80% of our budget is salaries and, and um, all the different things that come along with salaries. As you get uh, more mature, you, hopefully you'll have a 401k and all that sort of, all the whistles and bells of a, um, of a for-profit company. I mean, my hope is that we'll, nonprofits and for-profits won't be so distinguishable in the in the future. This uh, we you need to think of yourself as a for-profit at, at times and value your time. And yes, those people funders will pay for that, uh, but you have to have the gumption to put the money in there. Is that? Yeah, excellent. Um, is there, uh, Kristen asks if there's any advice on persisting early on with uh, starting up being so tough. Um, I should also note that we know that there are uh, some current folks who are operating care farms and you're more than welcome to chime in here too if you have any advice to share, so. I, I can share a little advice um, both from starting a nonprofit in the past and starting a care farm now, and it is so daunting, but if you can do anything to start, like even if you don't have land or anything, if you can do anything like to volunteer, you know, have like c connect with other farmers or farmers markets or just some actual act of growing and creating something, it gives you so much energy. And then you have pictures and then you have connections and then you ha have the confidence that you can do something. I mean, you won't make any money doing it. You'll, it's all sweat equity, but it, any anything you can just start with, with the people you want to help, even if it's one time a month or once a year, it's, it will take you so far. Thanks, Eliza. I want to make sure, since there are some questions in here, that we get to all of them. Uh, Ingrid, you had asked about models of care farms, which generate uh, most of their income through sales. And Andrea put in there that link where you can kind of look through um, and filter for the for-profit, the LLC models there. 
Kenneth is asking, what about government funding and fee for service? I I quickly add Homesteads for Hope is doing a lot of enterprise is what I'd call that when you're doing more sales. Um, and that is the way that they're going. They're going at it a very different uh, with a different strategy than Red Wiggler. Um, and they have their reasons and we think it's great. But that's a, a Homesteads for Hope. Sorry. What was the other one about government? Um, the question is, what about government funding and fee for service? I'll I'll say that for me, um, you know, I was a starving artist. The last thing I wanted to do was get in bed with government. Um, and I had seen what government was doing to the organization where I was working, where it became a checkbox situation. And I just didn't want any part of that. Um, and 27 years later, after looking at it probably three or four times, like maybe we should be getting uh, government money to do what we're doing because it's out there. Every time we look at it, we'd have to hire more people than we can afford to service. Uh, but that's us. And please do not take that as a, a you know, every every care farm is different. Every environment where you are is different. You may have a very different, I just got really lucky landing in Maryland, in Montgomery County, Maryland, um, and have been able to raise the money. Not everybody's in that situation. Uh, so there are ways to get government money. Then there's fee for service, which I think, um, I think Andre has a better bead on which organizations are, are doing better there, but I think of Cura in our area, Cura Personalis is doing a good job. They're an equine outfit and they're on the map. Um, and they are a nonprofit, but they do a lot of fee for service. Um we just didn't get set up like that. So, you know, how you set yourself up in the beginning, uh, it's kind of hard to sometimes kick out of that. Uh without the, the founder leaving. Nobody seems to want to take my job right now. <laughs> um, fee for so, service, there are good examples of them. Uh, search through the map is what I'd say. Uh, but Cure Personalis is the one that comes to mind. Yeah, I'm going to mention two things in here. Um, and this is just a nod again towards another session because I got a direct message um, around asking if there's a website or any help in setting up the accounting categories for nonprofits in order to kind of show their accurate annual budgets. It was in session two that we went through accounting. Um, so check that out. I think, I'm sorry, they're all swirling in my head right now. It could have been session three, but we did have, uh, we talked about some kind of accounting and there's a CPA on that resource guide too, who is um, helping to offer services. Uh, I also didn't mention that uh, Care Farming Network offers uh, consultations. So when we're getting into uh, real, where when you have specific questions that you feel like, hey, this is really want to walk through this with someone, please reach out to us because that is where we can look at your, you know, individual farm operation and address questions too. And you can find information on uh, our website. Um, about how how the consultations work. Um, I want to do one quick thing and just go back and share my screen because I found out what happened. I forgot a slide. Um, and I just want to go over this really quick because I think it's worthwhile. Um, I'll remember that a lot of people might not understand what care farming is. A lot of donors might not understand. One of our reasons for being a network is because we're trying to build awareness about care farming. But um, it's a relatively new concept. So just remember, you know, you got to clearly define what your own care farm's purpose is um, and the benefits that your care farm's providing. Um, on our website, we do have a video. It's short. You can see it's less than four minutes that you can direct people to, um, which is a nice comprehensive overview of care farming or something that you could, you know, put into your marketing work. 
Um, so it introduces people, as, you know, to care farming as a concept. And we also have a lot of resource pages that um, include research that shows the benefits of care farming. So as you're getting into maybe some of those grant proposals or talking with donors, if you can actually show, hey, here are the benefits and it's uh, scientifically proven uh, what we already know to be true, um, we have lots of links and resources available for you uh, to look at there. So. Uh, with all that being said, we have, um, I think, I hope covered all of the questions. I was just looking at chat. Um, really want to thank uh, anyone else. Oh, I have a, just to reinforce this idea back up to the spreadsheet thing. Um, the, the, some advice I got early on was, okay, take your, the, you, as a nonprofit, you have to file a 990. The 990 has categories of, of line items for a, a, a budget. Um, go ahead and adopt those. Maybe collapse some of them. But what the lesson here is, there, there's entities out there that are going to be asking you for like financials. And generally, they give you a structure to work with. Though that's the, the fastest path is use their structures. And then over time, you will you will develop your own. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the beginning, you know, the if you're starting a nonprofit, the 1023, that that is your, you know, where you go to figure out how to create a budget. Anyway, absolutely. Being really being really uh creative with like saying, all right, what what opportunities do I have and what what kind of materials are they giving me to start with? And just using those rather than starting a, a business plan from scratch, use somebody else's. There's one last question here that I just want to, um, oh, Andrea already answered it from Nikki. Um, and I, I will second that you know, partnerships, whether it's 4-H or extension, that's not going to disqualify you from any kind of grant. If anything, it strengthens you, your ask. Anything that shows collaboration with other organizations, I think is really, it's what a lot of funders actually really like to see nowadays, um, that you've done your research, that you're able to work with others, um, can be a little bit more of a process if you're asking for funding as a collaboration. Um, but uh, absolutely. And if people want to see that, you know, networks are strong, people are working together. So. Well, with that being said, thank you again. Um, this wraps up our, our beginning care farming series. We hope that the information that was provided was helpful. Uh, please, you know where to find us. One more call out for that evaluation. Um, I wish I could give prizes right now, but I'll just make you feel really warm and fuzzy for saying that you're really good people if you fill that out. Uh, you're good people even if you don't, though. So thank you so much for coming and um, best of luck to you and stay in touch. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.